to use it. Again, the technique I'm going to teach you, which I, I think is the one I taught you in intro, is the Gibney basket weave. And if you notice the way I start my under wrap, I start distal and go proximal. I always do that on everything. It's habit for me. It's lymphatic return. It's the way to. I don't think you're wrong if you start proximal and work distal unless there's a lot of swelling in it. But I, again, it's just kind of that habit. I go long lever. Uh, I know that if you're working with soccer athletes, they don't like this down in the arch. Football players don't even notice it. It's not a problem unless you do it wrong with that base anchor. So if you're in here and watch me as I'm taping with the soccer players, I won't even put this base anchor there. Or if I do, I'm going to put it with the two-inch elastic light glass. So again, all kinds of modifications based on the athlete, the footwear, the injury, all kinds of things to think about. Melinda, I found out, made an error <laughs> and got two-inch tape rather than inch-and-a-half tape. And everybody's loving it so far um, for ankle taping. And so um, this is like at Ohio State, they order 100 cases of two-inch tape and 250 cases of inch-and-a-half tape for the year, where we order 80 cases of inch-and-a-half. So again, just the difference. And we probably have as many athletes as they do. Okay. But again, the anchors, and if you notice, my edges come up. And as we work down, they're going to come across. So actually, I'm going to shift to inch and a half, um, just because I want to make sure the Gibney basket weave starts with an anchor and an anchor. And then you're going to go with the stirrup. And I want the front edge of the stirrup at the midpoint of the medium malleolus, the front edge of the stirrup at the midpoint of the lateral malleolus. Anchor, anchor, stirrup, Gibney basket weave. Lace up. Top edge of the lace up at the inferior aspect of the medial malleolus, and it comes around. You're going to hit about the middle of the lateral malleolus because of the height difference. It's not going to be the same exact position. Biggest mistake most people make is right here. On the second stirrup, it should be two full widths wide and just barely one inch wide. And so as you bring it up, again, same thing over here. I have two full widths and barely one width. So that when this is done, it's going to have a huge be your wedge. Most of you will make it too straight up, and you want that fanning because it helps with it. So again, anchor, anchor, stirrup, lace up, stirrup, half lapping your lace up, stirrup, again, look at that. Three full, boy, I got to do this to you, sorry, buddy. And you'll be able to get even with me on the test. I will. You will actually, <laughs> Again, look at that. I got three full widths. I got one width. And then as it comes up, three full widths, one width. And look at these little, little gaps here. This is no big deal because that's not a friction area. That's not a problem. Okay? So again, anchor, anchor, stir up, lace up, stir up, lace up, stir up, lace up. We've done three. A regular ankle that's uninjured, I'm going to do three stirrups. A size 12, 13, 14 foot, I might do four, okay? So it just depends, or if I've got an acute injury that's got lots of instability, I might do five. Just depends on what you're doing. But the give me basket then, once you've done your anchors, your stirrups, then you're going to continue to lace it following the contour of the lower extremity, half flapping your tape all the way up to the top anchor. You're going to lace it up through the arch, generally one, two, Three strips. And the way the Gibney was taught, it was done. That's where it stopped. The logic is the stirrups controlled the inversion. The lace-ups held the stirrups in so that you could control the inversion. There was really nothing in this technique to manage plantar flexion. And we know that most ankle sprains are inversion plantar flexion and mechanism. So what we've done is with the Gibney basket weave, and again it's a basket because it's all three directions. I, I, by the way, hardly nobody does a Gibney anymore. There's actually some thought that it's actually a more stable because of the alternating d directions that pulls it in tighter. I don't do it because I want to go quick. I'm going to go anchor, anchor, stirrup, 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 lace, 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 arch, 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 and right into my heel locks, figure eights. I can do it faster if I'm not doing constant directional changes. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So nothing wrong with it. If you see, it's a great technique, but it shouldn't finish here. The heel lock and figure eight process that I teach is 
you'll, I, you, want it, you need to know it this way, and I'm going to show you two modifications to it today. So you start at the point of injury. This will be the biggest mistake most of you will make, because you're probably going to be doing my left ankle on a test, and you're probably going to start it on the medial aspect, which is the deltoid ligament, which is what isn't injured in an inversion plantar flexion injury. Right? So if you're doing a left, again, if you notice, I went from medial to lateral with my stirrups to control this inversion plantar flexion. If I've got an eversion, I'm going to go from lateral to medial. I'm going to pull the edges up into tight off position. So from my point of injury, yes, this sounds familiar. Remember the cloth ankle, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. The center of the tape hits the center of the medial malleolus, hits the heel cord straight into my hip pocket, through the arch, up over the top. I don't even have to look at this thing. Center hits the center lateral. Rock it straight through. We're going to do two heel locks on each side. Man, those are pretty today. And then we're going to bring it up a little bit higher, and we're going to go right into that figure of eight. And back down and continue down. Now, a lot of places, if you're not a real good taper, tear after the heel locks and then start your figure of eight. If you're a pretty skilled taper, you can do it continuous, and it's going to be fine. But what happens is that the transition from the heel lock to the figure of eight um, is where you get pinching if you're not a good skilled taper. So I, I was, I'm working in the athletic training room here now, and I'm seeing two or three patients that have big cuts from the tape up the back side because that transition, they weren't getting the right pressure. So I want two heel locks, two figure eights. I'll call these a regular heel lock. Somebody else might call mine a reverse heel lock, okay? And I'll give you a reverse heel lock in a few minutes. Everybody with me on that? So give me basket weave with a heel lock and figure of eight. It should be two heel locks, two figure of eights, and it will look like that. Okay? Now, sometimes I even find myself with a little gap back here. So you always have to look on the back side and make sure you don't have a gap. Sometimes I'll actually have a triangle-shaped gap here and here. That's okay. That's not a problem. It's the gap back here that's a problem. Okay? Everybody with me on that? Make sure you don't have the gap up there, and it should be nice, smooth, and, and fit and follow the contour. I see a lot of people after they do their figure eights, lace it all the way up, you're wasting product. It's not necessary. There's no reason to relace it again, okay? A lot of people do it. You're just wasting product. No sense, okay? So let's modify the stirrups on this. 